This video is on plum case paralysis. This is one of the lesions of brachial plexus. So we will study plum case paralysis under the following headings and these are the site of the lesion, then what are the causes, motor loss that means which muscles are paralyzed and as a result of paralysis of those muscles what will be the position of hand and in the end we will also look at the sensory loss. Now the site of lesion in case of clump case paralysis is the lower trunk of the brachial plexus. So this is the lower trunk of the brachial plexus and we can see here this is formed by the ventral rami of C8 and T1 spinal nerves. So the nerve roots that will be involved in clump case paralysis they will be C8 and T1 but mainly it is C1 and partly it is C8. Now these nerve fibers from C8 and T1 spinal nerves they are carried by two important nerves and these are the ulnar nerve which actually contains only fibers from C8 and T1 and the median nerve which although contains fibers from C5 to T1 because this is formed by two roots medial, medial root right which will be from the medial cord and the lateral root which will be from the lateral cord. So this will also carry the nerve fibers from C8 and T1 spinal nerves. So these um, the muscles and the area of the skin which will be supplied by these nerve roots that will be affected. Let us look at the cause right the cause will be undue separation of the arm from the trunk right so there will be hyper abduction so this is an abduction injury so when will this occur this may occur as we can see in this picture suppose a person is falling down and clutches something which comes uh, in his or her way it could be a branch of a tree so the body is moving down because of the gravity but the hand is clutching to that object right here it is a branch of tree so what will happen there will be hyper abduction here and the lower trunk of the brachial plexus will get stretched and may get injured so this is one another is uh, the birth injury right so during vaginal delivery what may happen if the a uh, hand is pulled and it is separated from the trunk right if there is undue abduction so that can also lead to the uh, clump case paralysis. Now let us look at the motor loss. So what will be the motor loss mainly it will be the intrinsic muscles of the hand that will be paralyzed because they are supplied by C8 and T1 spinal segments. And in that also mainly it will be the lumbricals and the introsciae. So let us look at the nerve supply of lumbricals and introsciae. Median nerve that is going to supply first and second lumbricals. Allah nerve will supply third and fourth lumbricals. And it will also supply all palmar and all dorsal introsciae. So these muscles that is all the lumbricals and all the introsciae they will be paralyzed. In addition to that, there will be paralysis of thinar and hypothenar muscles also as well as the flexor carpi ulnaris and medial half of flexor digitorum profundus in the forearm, right, in the anterior compartment of the forearm which are supplied by ulnana, they will also be paralyzed. But the main effect will be because of the paralysis of limbricals and introsciae. So here let us look at the action of limbricals and introsciae. So these muscles, especially here we can see the limbricals, they are responsible for flexion at metacarpophalangeal joint. These are the metacarpophalangeal joints and extension at the interphalangeal joint. Very important action when you are writing, when you are holding something, needling or painting, drawing anything. So this position is required. So what are the limbricals and introsciae doing? flexion at the metacarpophalangeal joint and extension at the interphalangeal joint. You can see here the L is formed, right? So limbricals also start with L, that way you can remember. Now in case of clump case paralysis, obviously these movements will not be possible. So what will be the position of the hand? So the classic presentation in clump case paral paralysis is claw hand. So we can see here there is hyper extension at in the metacarpophalangeal joint and flexion at the interphalangeal 
joint. So this is the typical appearance of claw hand. Hyperextension at metacarpophalangeal joints and flexion at interphalangeal joints just opposite to the action of these because they are lost. Coming to sensory loss, now here we can see this is the anterior aspect of the upper limb and this is the posterior aspect of the upper limb. Right? And here we can see uh, the skin or the cutaneous innervation of C8 and T1 spinal segments on both the sides. So the sensory loss will be along a narrow zone along the medial side of hand and the forearm. So that will be the sensory loss here. Sometimes some additional symptoms are seen in clump case paralysis other than those we have discussed, the motor loss and the sensory loss in case of upper limb. And these symptoms, they constitute the Horner syndrome. So why this happens? Because there is involvement or injury to the sympathetic fibers which pass via the T1 spinal nerve. And the lesion in this case is proximal to the white ramus communicantes to the first thoracic ganglia. So let us revise the general anatomy of a typical spinal nerve. So here we can see this is the cross section of T1 spinal segment. This is the gray matter. We can see here this is the sensory horn, this is the motor horn and this is the lateral horn. So lateral horn that contains here the sympathetic preganglionic neurons. We all know that the sympathetic outflow is thoracolumbar. That means the sympathetic innervation to all the parts of our body that is received only from certain spinal segments and these are from T1 to L1, right? So in case of head region, the sympathetic supply to the blood vessels there, to the sweat glands there and to the smooth muscles which are present anywhere in the head region, they will be supplied by the uh, sympathetic neurons which are located in T1 spinal segment. So this one has to remember that head and neck, the sympathetic supply is from T1 spinal segment. Now let us see how these sympathetic preganglionic neurons, they will reach the head. Now they will pass along the ventral root of the spinal nerve and after that they, we can see here they will go to the ventral ramus. Now this a ventral ramus is connected to the sympathetic ganglion in the sympathetic chain via two uh, communicantes or two rami and these are the white ramus and the gray ramus. So these preganglionic sympathetic neurons they will pass from the ventral ramus of T1 spinal nerve via the white ramus communicantes to the sympathetic ganglion of T1. Now, those sympathetic fibers which have to supply upper limb, right, the, what they will do? They will pass through the gray ramus and enter again the ventral ramus and the dorsal ramus, right? So, that way they, they will go. But some of them which are destined to reach the head region, they will not synapse here. So, these preganglionic neurons, sympathetic neurons, they will pass through the white ramus communicantes reach the ganglion, T1 ganglion and ascend up through the sympathetic chain. They will reach the superior cervical ganglion in the neck and there they will synapse. From here, the postganglionic sympathetic neurons will go to the head region and they will supply certain structures here. They will actually supply all the blood vessels or the smooth muscles also, but we are concerned only about these here. So they will be supplying here. You can see three structures sweat glands, right, mainly of the face, the other region also, then Muller's muscle, right, this Muller muscle is actually superior tarsal muscle and the superior tarsal muscle is the smooth muscle part of levator palpebrae superioris, as the name suggests, levator means it will elevate, palpebrae means eyelid, which eyelid, the superior one, so that's why the name is levator palpebrae superioris, which is involved in elevation of the upper eyelid. Then it will also supply the dilator pupillae muscle, right, which is responsible for dilation of pupil, right. So this is clear now how the sympathetic fibers from the T1 spinal nerve, they reach the head region. 
as I said, in this case, where will be the lesion? The lesion has to be proximal to the white ramus communicantis. That means it will be here. Before the white, through the white ramus, the fibers reaches the, reach the sympathetic ganglion, right? So let us see here, what are the characteristic features of the Horner syndrome? There is partial ptosis. Ptosis is drooping of eyelid. And why it occurs? Because of paralysis of levator palpebrae superioris muscle, which actually contain both the types of fibers, skeletal as well as smooth. So the skeletal part is supplied by third cranial nerve, that is oculomotor. But the smooth muscle part of the levator pal palpebrae superioris, which we also call as Muller's muscle or superior tarsal muscle, this is supplied by sympathetic fibers. So this won't be there. So there will be partial ptosis, right? Not complete ptosis, okay? Then there will be a meiosis. Meiosis is what? Constriction of pupil. Why this will happen? Because the dilator pupillae muscle that is paralyzed. So there is unopposed action of, cons uh, of the constrictor pupillae muscle which, is which has a parasympathetic supply. And then there will be anhydrosis. Anhydrosis is decreased sweating because the sweat glands again they receive their nerve supply from the sympathetic fibers. So that's all for today. And thank you for watching. If you have not subscribed, please subscribe so that I can put more videos. And if you want questions and answers from anatomy, all of them, all important questions and answers, then please visit my website that is anatomyqa.com. I'll put the link of this website also in the description box.